Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I have a very exciting guest for today. Personally, I am incredibly honored to have Tom Shepard with me on the podcast. Tom has been someone that I have admired since the very first days as an overland traveler for me. I remember walking into the Land Rover dealership in Scottsdale and seeing this book that said Vehicle Dependent Expedition Guide. And I remember my hands nearly trembling as I was asking the service counter person if it was actually for sale, and it was. And I still have that book today, and I have since purchased all of his other volumes. We worked with Tom on bringing the Vehicle Dependent Expedition Guide into the United States. His expeditions are considered some of the most effectively planned and executed in history. And this was, some of these big ones were done before GPS, before modern communication and navigation. So they would use a sun compass and they crossed the entire length of the Sahara all off track from coast to coast. Tom Shepard is also an incredible photographer. He has a lot of passion for Northern Africa and has traveled there extensively. And he's also had a wide range of vehicles and every single one of them he prepares in nearly the same way with a great deal of simplicity and minimalism to his approach. There is a lot to learn from Tom. He's about to celebrate his 90th birthday. A huge happy birthday to Tom. This was such a joy for me to do. I'm so grateful that we had the chance to sit down and talk with Tom Shepard. And a special thanks to Rocky Talkies for their support of this week's podcast. Rocky Talkies are backcountry radios designed by a small team in Denver. The radios are extremely rugged, easy to use, and compact, weighing in at just under 8 ounces. They have a range of 1 to 5 miles in the mountains and up to 25 miles line of sight. The batteries will last from three to five days and you can recharge them easily via USB-C right in the vehicle. Our team uses Rocky Talkies and we also used them recently at the Overland Expo. The next Overland Expo, stop into our booth and say hello and check out the radios for yourself. And as a listener of the Overland Journal podcast, you can get 10% off a pair by going to rockytalkie.com forward slash Overland Journal. Thanks again, Rocky Talkie. Tom, it's very humbling for me to be sitting here with you because you're someone that I truly admire. Yeah. Um, and I'm grateful that we get to tell your story to the people that listen to the Overland Journal podcast. It's very reassuring, actually, yeah. to hear your, uh, your reaction uh, uh, w- when you got the book or when you first mm. saw it, yeah. um, which um, it helps me. It filled me with wonder, Tom. Yeah. It truly <laughs> did. Yeah. Just from the cover image to, you know, and your. <laughs> I remember the, f- the first image that I saw that has stuck in my mind was, it was a, a photograph, I believe it was of the Range Rover being craned onto a ship. And I remember it as if I saw it 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, because again, it's those, it's those kinds of experiences that you've had that we're all seeking for. We're seeking yeah. for this adventure. Yeah, that was the Range Rover that broke the track rod actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to start from from your military career. So you had a full career as a, as a fighter pilot. Um, and, and how long were you in the British Air Force? I was in, in, the, in the RAF for 25 years. Uh-huh. Uh, I started off at Cranwell, which is uh, very lucky to get in there. That's yeah. Royal Air Force College, and where they train career officers. And I came out of there and went into a fighter squadron. And as a Cranwell, uh, graduate, they tend to give you a series of channeling jo- uh, of challenging jobs anyway. Mm. So again, you benefit from that. Yeah. And then I went in, into squadron, went onto the onto the as well as being a pilot, mm. I was also the what they call the sea flight commander, which mm. looked after the technical side as well, which had broadened my my horizons quite a lot. Well, and I can see that that not only that that discipline around being a pilot, but what you would have gained for insights around planning and logistics yeah. in that in that position of leadership, I, I suspect that that helped your future expeditions. Well, it, it did. In, in point of fact, when I was in in Cyprus, that was the first thing that that I, I uh, uh, applied myself to was getting a sort of mobility plan. Mm. 
there were Beverly's and Hastings aircraft, uh, cargo aircraft. And if we deployed anywhere, we would have to have X number of, of, uh, of items of technical equipment mm. and, and gun packs and all kinds of stuff. And I made plans of, of these aircraft. And sure enough, we, I can't even remember why, why we went there, actually, but we deployed to Jordan, just okay. over the road, you know, sure. from Cyprus. It sure. wasn't exactly the dark side of the moon. Yeah, <laughs> but, sure. But we went there, and suddenly in the middle of the night, you know, the, uh, the flight commander came and said, hey, you've, got, you've still got those drawings. I said, well, yeah, I have as a matter of fact, yeah. Mm. And, and off we went. Uh, and, it, and it worked. The, I guess the first expedition that I'd like to talk about is, is one of the most notable ones that you've completed, which was the first successful uh, west to east crossing of the entire Sahara um, from ocean to ocean. Yes. And what, what inspired that trip? Yeah, by that time, I had done a number, a mm. large number of, uh, of desert trips mm. in, in the Sahara in particular. Uh, and it was, um, uh, uh, I can't remember the chap's name now, but a Frenchman who had gone into what, they, what he named as the Mauritanian Empty Quarter. Okay. And uh, that was sort of like terra incognito, sure. really, and no one had sort of been right across it. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great to go across there mm. and, uh, and, and carry on? Yeah. And then I was searching for some, I mean, you can't, do that just for the hell of it you know it's a pretty expensive hobby yeah <laughs> i thought well you know what can we do that's useful and i contacted all manner of people universities and the world geographical society and so on and they came up or oh, i can't remember how it arose now but anyway we it it turned out that there hadn't been a complete coast to coast gravity survey mm. done before and that was how I met up with Jeff Renner, mm. who was the, uh, the scientist on, on the trip, as well as a great, I mean, he was British Antarctic Survey, so mm. he knew all about, you know, operating in remote areas sure. and teamwork and all that kind of stuff. But he was immaculately uh, uh, thorough in, in what he did. And while we were all buzzing about, you know, getting uh, bogged or unbogged or being cooked or <laughs> sure. sorting out the water or whatever, Jeff was there looking. We used to t pull his leg, actually, because his the, a gravimeter is a device of enormous value. Came in, in a shockproof, vibration-proof uh, uh, box. Makes sense. Sure. And when he put it on the ground, he had to put it on the ground, then he had to look through. And we used to pull his leg, but he was looking through to, to the devil. And the, <laughs> so. But he went on and, and got this, uh, it, it, it was unique. Uh, I mean, he sure. got recognition from the Royal Geographical Society. Yeah. So that was how the, the scientific aspect of the trip came. Well, and that genuinely, I think, shifts from an overland adventure to an expedition. Once you've either incorporated some degree of scientific weight to yes. the trip yeah. or you're providing some medical support you're doing some greater good yeah. than just being uh, like I do which is I, I tend to most of the time just be an adventurer yeah. mucking about no law against that no, <laughs> yeah, against no. That. no. but but it's it's genuine these expeditions that you've done because they incorporated so many other things like for example uh, you worked with UNESCO on yes. the cave, the cave art and the rock art. Yeah, that was uh, after one of my uh, trips to well, a number of my trips to uh, to, to Libya, and um, it occurred to me that there were these cave paintings there all around the Jebel Uwainat, which is the we used to call it NASA's corner because yeah. we on our air, aircraft we we couldn't go across Egypt, so we flew around that to get to to uh, uh, Sudan, uh, Khartoum, and um, that. Uh, mountain there, Jabal Uwainat and Akinu, uh, were absolutely alive, I mean mm. literally alive, with cave paintings, rock mm. art, carvings and, and that kind of thing, Incredible. all around the place. Incredible. And it, the, what that really said to you about the, the history of, of that place was, the, uh, was indicated by the, the carvings themselves. Mm. There was one uh, there are lots of, of, of carvings of, of cattle, mm. long-hauled cattle, and uh, giraffes. Which is fascinating. Which, which indicates what, what it had been like in the past. I mean, when we went through there, 
uh, and I went there on my first uh, visit in 1960 and I did a, another two visits after that um, it was you know very barren mm. there was a, a spring there was still a spring there mm. and in fact on the first Yes, the first trip I, w I went down there, there were actually some people living there. Ah, interesting. So they were some, heaven knows how, uh, uh, carving out a, a living. Equally, though, it was on a, a traffic route from northern Sudan into Libya. Ah, okay. Which were a lot of, lot of labour uh, went, went that way. And sure. The trucks went there. When looking back at that 1975 Trans-Sahara expedition, what were some of the, the key learnings that you had? Because that is such an ambitious undertaking. Well, you're, you're right. You know, there was some learning to do and some preparation mm. to do. And what that involved, I thought it would be smart to do a reconnaissance. Ah. You know, I'd heard about the Mauritanian empty quarter and it sounded a bit, um, a bit of a challenge. This was 1973. Now, my first trip in the desert had been in 1960 mm. with the Royal Air Force Regiment. That was my very first trip. And the Libyan sand sea was a nice sand sea because <laughs> the, the sand was friendly ah. in as much as it wasn't so soft and fine and, and not so sort of wind, quite as wind blown. Well, it was wind formed, sure. but not wind blown. It, it behoved, having heard what, what Mauritania was like, I thought we'd better go and take a sniff at mm. this. And the question of the, the long range, you know, how can you... Uh, Carry enough fuel, 800 yeah. miles, have you got enough fuel to do that? What, are, what vehicles are we going to use? A nice, agile vehicle like the Range Rover would go there like, like a bunny rabbit, you know, mm. but it, it would run out of fuel about a third of the way across. Sure. A, a, a four-ton truck... Uh, would carry the load, but it was a bit of a, the power weight ratio wasn't wasn't up to it, mm. and so on. So basically, what we did in nineteen in seventy three, I I might add, I got and I couldn't have done this without the sponsorship of the RAF. The RAF recognised the benefit to servicemen mm. per se of organising expeditions in challenging conditions such as as the desert mm. and logistically challenging conditions and that mm. kind of thing so to cut a long story short i managed to persuade <laughs> the, the raf to a to learn to obtain a bedford four-ton truck uh, that, that we could use sure. uh, as as comparison a Comparison B was the 110 Land Rover, mm. which was kind of one ton, no, no, about three quarter ton, but all the loaders over the back axle. Mm. Then there was the Range Rover, which would go there a lot like a bunny rabbit, but mm. it wouldn't carry the fuel. So, enter stage left, uh, RAF Hercules mm. aircraft, into which we would cram these vehicles. <laughs> oh, no, you won't, said the man. Why not, I said, because they won't fit. So what we had to do then was to put the Land Rover on top of the Bedford truck, <laughs> then sure. take the wheels off to lower it down so sure. it didn't hit the roof, and then take the Bedford truck with the Land Rover in, and then the Range Rover in behind that. Unbelievable. So off we went. And we landed at a place called Arak, where the Maur Mauritanians, lovely people, mm. and uh, no less so were, were there soldiers and gendarmes and all the rest of it. So we landed one day uh, at, at Iraq and um, the message, of course, hadn't actually got through <laughs> that we were coming. <laughs> so here we are, a, a foreign invading force, you know, <laughs> complete with, with sure. MC and all the rest of it. Right. And these lovely Maur Mauritanian soldiers coming up and, and saying, uh, hey, um, can we, what can we do for you <laughs> So there was a certain amount of negotiation went on. Yeah, but sure. to cut a long story, we got about, um, I suppose, 200 miles into the empty quarter. Ah. Um, not without some problems, of course. Sure. Inevitably, yeah, the, the Range Rover the the galloping road. ahead, sure. you know, on, on uh, uh, deflated tires and so on. The, the, rain, the, the Land Rover hacking it, but yeah. with certain problems due to the load distribution and still three quarters of a ton not taking enough fuel mm. and the Bedford carrying you know a million jerry cans and and the food and the kitchen and and so on and so forth got that managing it in four-wheel drive but having to be towed every now and then 
tandem towed Range Rover at the front, Land Rover, Bedford. Sure. All together, woof, and yeah. then out, out it came. Wow. So we had several of those, and that gave me a very good idea of, of what, what the terrain was going to be like, mm. and formed my idea then as to the kind of vehicles that we needed. And just happens to be that Land Rover released a new vehicle. Just happened. Yeah. I couldn't believe my luck. Yeah. I heard about that because the you know we, we looked at looked at the one ten Land Rover and said no, nah, isn't going to do it, and the yeah. and the the power weight ratio on on the Bedford wasn't wasn't any. But just at that time, the uh, FBRD Fighting Vehicles Research and Development Unit uh, had passed for production the forward control uh, Land Rover mm. one 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 oh one. Mm -hmm. Which, being built for air dropping, was very lightweight. the The cockpit was an ergonomic catastrophe, actually, yeah, sure. Sure. <laughs> because uh, you, you know there was about fifty ways you you could you could cut yourself or <laughs> bruise sure. your leg or, or or something like that. The steering wheel was about this big, yeah. but it did the job. And the 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 and the the the, the main payload, which have cons uh, comprised four. 45 gallon drums, that's 400 litre drums of fuel, could mm. sit right in the middle mm. between the front axle and the rear track. So ideal weight distribution. For sure. No problem at all, all strapped down and so on and so forth. And so, they were V8s, were they? Sorry? Were they V8s? Yes, they were. Yeah. Okay. V8 engine so you got uh, some power sitting to like ratio. there to the driver. Yeah, sure. And, and warming him appropriately in, in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and there was even by by then further stripping it down, taking the top off, taking the windscreen off, and all that kind of thing. We could mount the sun compass, which is what we were using as the principal navigation aid. Mount the sun compass right there, free uh, free to, to to get the sun for the shadow for, for the for the gnomon and and navigate with, and for the driver to see. So it was an ideal setup. For those that are watching on YouTube, you'll see these images that we were able to get from Tom that show the sun compass, which this would have all been pre-GPS. Did you also use um, any celestial navigation? Yes, we did. That, that was the thing. I had a great, great friend of mine, Phil May, who was a, then a corporal in the army, the British army, down in Salisbury. Mm. Uh, and he taught navigation oh, wow. to people, and he was as bright as a button, mm. very, very sharp indeed, mm. and a really nice guy, very mm. calm, very proficient. Mm. Proficient. We had him uh, as the the overseer mm. on the astro uh, a astro shots, yeah. star shots. You would have to have at least three star. Uh, three star shots yeah. to, to get a fix. Yeah, now, as often as not, I mean, when on my subsequent trip, I was, if, if you got, got one or two of them cocked up, something like that, you'd have to do another one. You would spend yeah. all night you know, right. doing them. And I, I was taking on, on my, my later trip in 78, I was doing, uh, being less proficient than Phil, <laughs> Sure. I was doing anything up to five or, or six star sure. shots to try and get a decent cocked out. The intersection lines of the, of the three, uh, uh, position lines yeah. had to be, make a small topped hat, as, sure. as we call it. Sure. The sun compass would essentially give you a bearing, which is what you were primarily navigating. Yes, to. that's right. With the, the the ingenuity of the sun sun compass it is actually beyond praise. Mm -hmm. The coals. I don't know who. I don't know very much about Mr. Coles, but mm -hmm. he deserves to go down in history. Mm -hmm. All the instructions were on on the face of the compass. You could give it to a chimpanzee and you'd say, oh yeah, da 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 yeah, time of year, time of day, sun time, Greenwich mean time, this kind of thing. You set it all, set it up, all on the on the face of the sun compass. Slide the gnome one up and down, move it round to the heading you wanted, drive with the compass on the on the movable reference item, and, and there you are. You had to be careful that every 15 minutes as the sun went round, you had to change. Ah, sure. Adjust. So in fact, yeah. technically, you were actually, you were not going in a straight line, you were going in a series of shallow arcs, sure. but you were getting there and yeah. it was dead accurate. Incredible, incredible. And to, I think about today, the luxuries that we have for travel, 
I, I can navigate by GPS. I can have all of the, I showed you this morning on Gaia GPS, all these layers of maps. No law against it. No. Uh, well, yeah, but it's just, it's, it is fascinating. And yeah. to me, it just shows, you know, how much more proficient you had to be because you were going into, I mean, there was not even any satellite communication. You would have probably UHF radios would be the extent. Yeah, we had, uh, it was, um, yeah, it, it was sort of long wave ra radio yeah. action. We had to bounce aerials yeah. and everything else. And we had a chap there, uh, Kevin, who, who could uh, do, do the Morse code yeah. and all, da, 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 all very professional and everything else. Incredible. So we, we kept in touch uh, with, with the people at home yeah. there. When you finished that trip, what were the the couple of either modifications to the vehicle or equipment that you brought along that you thought, this is very special, I'm going to use it from now on? Was there anything well, that I you really... I think it, it reaffirmed my faith, or in, my faith in the Sun Compass. Mm. It uh, proved, why wouldn't it, the validity of having sound astro shots as backup. Mm. It emphasized the fact that you couldn't get good astro shots if there yeah. was cloud. <laughs> sure. So you had to uh, had to double bank on, on, on most things. Yeah. There. But uh, you know, navigation wise, I mean, again, the, to do the, the astro shots, you had a, pa a pack of books about, about that deep and mm. about, about that, that long, little tables, you know, the sure. astro tables. The mind boggles as to who wrote the box <laughs> know, or it's wrote in inverted commas. Impressive. Somebody had to do the mathematics for all that. Yeah, but, um, truly impressive. Yeah. And then you think about uh, like Shackleton and his crew in this t tiny dory. Boat oh, that's right. Going across the ocean, somehow taking these bear these these headings that's right yeah Unbelievable. with cold hands and and, and the, the the climatic climatic mm. problems they had were were about four times what we had truly sure you know we had very high temperatures but yeah. uh, it you know it it was livable you could work yeah Unbel unbelievable the, the the men who've, and women who've come before us and what they've accomplished is just yeah, yeah. truly That's unbelievable. Right. Yeah. So, so you finished this very notable expedition and it received high praise. It was even used um, in Rolex advertisements and it was, you know, it was, it was documented well. Royal Geographical Society gave me the Ness Award, mm -hmm. which I was really quite, quite uh, ha happy so. about. Team event, but yeah, you know, sure. they, they gave it to me, but yeah. And then there was a video that came out on that. And I've, yeah. seen it. I've seen it, it's quite good. As well as leading the, the trip, I was also the chief cinematographer. <laughs> so I had to, <laughs> went with, with Jeff down to, uh, again, it was an army uh, unit down in the south of England to learn the, you know, the tenets of, of, uh, of shooting films mm. and cutaways and zoom shots and, you know, uh, trying to get things in perspective, and above all, in in the desert, you know, keeping the cameras clean, so difficult, and keeping the the sand out. Yeah, the, I was I was very pleased to note that Anglia Television, as it was then, when they got the uh, when they got the film, they said we can't believe how clean this is. <sighs> and I would spend actually about an hour in the in the afternoon with with a with a squasher with a with, you know sure. a, a bulb puffer. You know, blowing sand off the lenses and making sure that the, and then we had to cut, keep the film cool. <laughs> the, the film stock had to be kept cool, and sure. I mean it was ex exposed. It had to be kept cool, and sure. then it had to be mailed out of the country. So the the first thing was after the empty quarter crossing, uh, when we got down to Carno, we we put a whole stack of of, uh, of film. Sure. in the post oh my and gosh. prayed that it would get oh through gosh. and everything yeah. else. And it did. It did. It oh, got through. Fantastic. You can imagine the customs people, oh, what's this, what's this, what's yeah. this, you know, but it, it got through. Unbelievable. And we, we shot some uh, more footage along the way and mailed that back from Khartoum mm. 
and a gain from Cairo because we had to get the inevitable shot yeah. by the pyramids. You sure, know. it's but, a wonderful film, and and I've I have found it a few times on on YouTube. It looks it's great. oh really yeah, yeah. oh god that's yeah, fantastic. Same at last YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and speaking of cinematography and, and photography, one of the things that, uh, you know, the initial impression is, of course, being impressed by your, by your CV, by your expeditions, but the more that I've gotten to know your content, um, especially for Overland Journal, it's the, it's the stunning images that you've captured, and you have a very unique way of setting the vehicle as a, as a minor character in a very beautiful place. So it's this sense of place that you've captured in your imagery that I find so exceptional. Is, is photography one of your great loves? It certainly is, absolutely, yeah. Uh, Jonathan Hansen, whom I believe you know, and yes. I think most people in, in the expedition world knows, yeah. uh, he's always pulling my leg about, because I have got this thing about wide angle lenses. <laughs> and I've just got a, an, an eight millimeter Samyang lens, which mm. you know take you can take a picture of the back of your head just about with this thing. <laughs> but the optics are superb, and it does give you a truly dynamic and in, inspiring new view mm. things that you would not have looked twice at you know mm. you take it through a wide angle fish uh, a fish eye lens and you say hey look at that yeah quite unusual. you know stop it down to f22 and get the, the sun uh sparkle from the sun and uh. all the rest of it. you can include the sun in the shot because heavens our whole life is influenced by the sun. Why not put it in the shot? Sure. Photography is very much my, my thing. Yeah. Very much my thing. Some of your books that you've produced that um, that maybe people don't even know about is like, for example, Quiet for a Tuesday. Yes. Um, which is just a, it's a beautiful volume um, and a great title. And then the other one is uh, The Nobility of Wilderness. Which yes. Is, um, we just spent some time looking at some photos on your on your computer from that and it they're just beautiful truly uh, yeah i must admit it, it you can't take a good photograph unless you're inspired by the subject mm. and if you have also got a camera that you really that you really chime with mm. uh, technically mm. and and physically and functionally it's difficult not to be inspired by the desert uh, yes. and, and the photography particularly with the, with the light you get there mm. there's one shot i took with a, a fisheye lens and it's deliberately pointed up it, it, no it wasn't a fisheye lens it was a very wide angle lens mm. very wide angle lens uh, it was pointed up so the horizon is curved there's one vehicle there the the the, the sky there's a hello a gradient on the sky going from pale blue right up to dark blue and the sun is in the shot mm. and that actually encapsulates mm. really uh in a harsh way uh, the you know the other angle of, of on the desert um, which is the sun constantly you, know, you don't you don't yeah. fool with that kind of thing <laughs> and it really gets a message across it does and and your images they they speak to the grandeur of algeria and tunisia and libya or these places that you've traveled um, and so few people have been able to experience uh, my my total time in algeria was minutes because I had accidentally crossed the border <laughs> so but uh, um, I would love to go back and I would love to spend yeah. the time like you have there the scenery there is uh, if you forgive the expression is to die for it is would you hope you wouldn't but yeah it is just in a class by itself mm. these uh, uh, the gigantic rock outcrops that you get all smoothed over the mind, you look at it, the mind boggles. You think, what is the temperature gradient of that after three months of high summer? Sure. What are the thermal stresses in it? Mm. And you can see the thermal stresses. They've, they've peeled away. You get an exfoliation at the top. The, the outer layer cracks away and it slides down to the bottom. And you get all this detritus around, around the bottom there. But you've still got this enormous uh, rock outcrop there. Mm. Algeria is in a class by itself. What an incredible place, truly. Yeah. Yeah. Truly. I mean, there's place again, and it isn't <clears throat> all really hot and hot and uh, and unbearable because mm. if you go down to Taman Rasset, for example, you're up in the Hogar Mountains, and the the scenery is just spectacular. Mm. 
there. And the temperature at 5,000 feet you know, is, very is lovely. Yeah, yeah. Very tolerable. There's a little monastery there ah. up, up the road from Taman Rasid. Um, and you, you climb up and the, the, the monks there must have really enjoyed themselves, I think, because, <laughs> I, I mean, what a, what a place to be. Ah. What a place to be. One of the questions that I, I really wanted to ask you is that in, in all of these journeys that you've done, this incredible career of travel, how has that changed you as a person? I'm not sure that it has changed me as much as reaffirmed me. Mm -hmm. um, by which I mean, I think it all started when I was about 10 years old. My father was a tea planter mm -hmm. up in the top right hand corner of India. We came back in 1946 in, uh, uh, after uh, partition and on the train from Calcutta to Bombay it's a long old journey mm. and I, uh, overnight uh, journey there and I woke up at uh, 10 years old woke up about five five o'clock in the morning the, the rest of the family were asleep and I looked out of the window we were in the desert at that time mm. and that, that really did it yeah, that really did it for me. Um, uh, it, it nailed it. Yeah. Uh, and it's been the same ever since, I think. Yeah. yeah. You know, the deserts can do that for us. Yeah. The, 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 the space, the cleanliness. I mean, there's a line in, in, in the Lawrence of Arabia, uh, where an, an inspirational film, yeah. where he, Lawrence says, God, I love this place. Yeah. And he he really got it when he's also he's on on his camel, <laughs> sing, singing on his camel and yeah. echoing off the uh, off the mountains in in Aqaba. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's like nowhere else. Yeah, it and does that strip actually away. where the Algerians I think have got to be <clears throat> careful how they handle it. Mm. They don't, you know, I don't want to to sound ex exclusive or anything, but you don't want. How can I put this tactfully? You know, I can't put it tactfully. You don't want a noisy rabble yeah. going into into the into the desert and leaving litter. Yeah. You want people who really appreciate yeah. the beauty of the place, respect it, and I yeah, respect it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like that those formative experiences that we have in our youth, and for you, you were able to do what you were meant to do. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I say, that was the, that was the impression formed on that train coming out to, uh, to, to from from the e east of Bombay, and it, it, it stayed with me ever since. Yeah. And I flew uh, flew some transport command as, as a supernumerary pilot initially, uh, you know, flying over the desert, and you look down, and that is absolutely <laughs> tear-jerking. It sure. really is. You see the dawn coming up, and the long shadows cast by the dunes and everything. And the first time I flew over Jebel Uwena at, at NASA's corner, that uh, that mountain on, on the bot there, really, it really it reduced me to tears. It really was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Built by off-roaders, for off-roaders. Onyx Off-Roads Route Builder provides a new solution to your adventure planning with a snap to functionality. Just draw a line with your cursor and the route will automatically snap to the road or trail. Hit save and the route will sync to your mobile device. Now you're ready to hit the trails. Go farther with Onyx Off-Roads Route Builder. You've had the opportunity to drive many different vehicles and which, you know, everything from these original Range Rovers to Ford Controls to, to uh, Defenders and G-Wagons and everything else. Uh, which one was your favorite? Not the one that necessarily worked the best, but the one that you just mm. loved. Oh, I think unquestionably the, uh, the G-Wagon. Mm. I, in, in the, when I got my G-Wagon, it, which would have been around 2000, year 2000, they were making the G-Wagon 461 as a van. Mm. So it got this immaculately conceived drive line, mm. you know, which was a lockable front diff, lockable back different change on the move please god make every vehicle <laughs> capable of doing that yeah. uh you could change on the move from low range to high range essential when you're getting out of really soft sand mm. and you cannot then stop no. to, to fiddle about with gear levers no. so it had all the driveline functionality that you needed um 
plus it was a van and it, it would carry a ton and a bit yeah there uh, so I mean that that I think tops the list coming up remarkably close I'm just thinking of, the, of the, that original Ranger. That original Ranger I had was a, a development vehicle. Mm. So we've got to give it some, some, some space some there. Some grace there, yeah. Yeah, like, like broken uh, <laughs> uh, track rods and things. And think, oh, and, and the fuel pump went in. Oh, my God, yeah. And that's you do. But that, that had potential. Again, sure. sadly, like the, the G-Wagon, it's mm. gone down the... the Money grubbing route yeah. of producing a uh, over specified luxury vehicle mm. for people who never even dare go off road. Yeah. But that that Range Rover had had the potential uh, uh, to to be a to be a winner, but it wasn't. Yeah. The next one down, I would say, the, the next honest vehicle, surprisingly for many people listening to this, is the Jeep Renegade Trailhawk yeah. two liter diesel. Yeah. A very modest looking vehicle. It looks like an ordinary sort of school run mm. wagon. But my word, the only thing it lacks is great. It could do with a bit more ground clearance. Mm. But the gem of that is, and the understated and unrewarded and unrecognized, is the ZF automatic transmission. Sure. It's got a transverse engine, so you've got very little in the way of space. Mm. I went round the G-Wagon factory and they, the, there were the chassis there being, being laid out. And they said, hey, this, is the, this is the one with the new, new seven-speed. The seven-speed transmission was about this long. <laughs> sure. And I thought, wow, terrific. And it was practically colliding with the rear axle. <laughs> what they've done in the, in the Renegade is produce a nine-speed gearbox, yeah. 12 inches wide. Yeah. And you think that is impossible. This is ZF. Yeah. Nobody ever says, hey, ZF, terrific. They should do. They yeah. should haul up the flag for ZF. <laughs> that is a good transmission. Yeah, because it, it is out, absolutely outstanding. Yeah. There was an, an, a, 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 an initial production problem when they had to transfer, for numbers, had to transfer production to a USA mm. because it did, didn't go right to start with. Mm. But the basic design is there as produced by ZF. And yeah. then they got the, the production up, up to it. And then the traction control and all of that works quite well. It does. Yeah. It, it's got it's got a, a, a diff lock. It hasn't yeah. got a front diff lock, yeah. but it's got uh, a, a locking diff in, in the in the middle. Yeah. In effect, it is an eight-speed usable range of gears. In point of fact, more like seven, mm. because you you come out of the garage and hundred yards down the road, it's in third gear. Yeah, sure. It starts off in second. First is kept for high days and holidays and sand that's that deep. Yeah, sure. And you can lock lock the the rear diff. Yeah. And you can go you can go in, into full time four wheel drive. It will revert to four by two all on its own. Mm. It's got everything fuel. is selectable, beautifully ergonomically placed and mm. written and and laid out. Oh, that's wonderful praise for the vehicle. I, I like them. They're they, and they're quite space efficient. They're a little box. Oh yes. A little box with wheels. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've taken the back seat out of mine, mm. and when I took it to uh, our Algeria. Um, I took the back seat out and I did a fairly comprehensive platform mod inside. Four jerry cans of fuel, two jerry cans of water, mm -hmm. whole lot of storage, little things, cupboards that lift up and all the rest of it. And, sure. that, and I can sleep in it as well. In the UK Amazing. when it's cold, I can put the, 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 the passenger seat forward mm. and I can put a sleeping bag inside. And even when it's cold outside, you just crack the windows down a little <laughs> bit to get out. Beautiful. Perfect. Beautiful. The, the thing that I remember about the G-Wagon the last time that I was here was how minimal the modifications were to it. Yes. You had things that you had learned over 40 years yes. that worked in the desert. Um, and I think it's helpful to kind of work through some of those things. I, I rem One of the things that stood out to me was you did have a, a backup battery, but it was connected with a manual switching, um, a, you know, Yes. Separator. Yes. Um, what, what's your motivation or what inspired you to, to go about it that way? I can't clearly remember. It will probably have been the fact that I didn't have the sensitive 
equipment sure. required to, to know when to switch from sure. the main battery to the, to the backup battery. Yeah. It's really right. I'm trying to remember what, what, what was running off it. A lot of things. Oh, that's right, the interior lighting. Yeah, and I think your uh, GPS uh, ran off and it. That's well. right, yeah, that's right. The navigation equipment and, and the in, interior lighting. And then, you had, lighting. and then you had this other very clever roof-mounted, um, you know, kind of uh, ventilation system. Yes. That you installed on the roof, and it just would f kind of ram air into the cabin. I also... I did initially on a Land Rover, mm. a 90 inch Land Rover, just a hood. Basically, I was using the air that had to hit this very steep windscreen and go up the windscreen. Sure. And that's all it had to do. So you didn't, you never got rain going into it. But so the, the intake was actually horizontal ah. like that. So the air went in there and then a couple of uh, eyeball things in it. Uh, it no worked. power, no fan, no nothing. And fantastic. it was fantastic. Yeah, very simple. And then when you when you camp in the desert, I don't know if this is something that you still do, but it, in some of your photographs, it shows you sleeping on a cot. Is that your preference? Yes. Yeah. Well, practical terms, you couldn't sleep in the vehicle because it was full of jerry cans sure. and things like that. Yeah. I was loath to... Uh, clobber up the roof with uh, heavy uh, drag inducing uh, rooftop uh, sure. tents and things sure. like that from which you couldn't see any anyway yeah sure but the joy of sitting on a on on a cot uh, a, a, a camp bed which only about that far off the ground yeah. is that you could turn over uh, no, i always slept with my feet facing south. Okay. So I would find that the constellations went over like this. Oh. <laughs> so I could tell, I could wake up in that. I didn't need to look at my watch. I knew where the plow was or, or some of the other constellations. I could say, oh yeah, it, it's about, I've got another couple of hours to go uh -huh. here. And it, absolute magic. And, and to, to just open your eyes and see the stars. Mm. You know, it's a shame to close your eyes, actually. Yeah. And in the moon, moonlight, of course, it yeah. was just unbelievable. You so know, those you, are the rewards of not locking yourself away in a tent or in the vehicle. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the desert really lends itself well. And, and I, <clears throat> one of the things that I do like about sleeping out under the stars is on the occasion that you get a little bit of rain, you hear that. It's amazing how we're still, in, through evolution, we, we know that sound, that little... Pitter patter that's of the rain. Absolutely right. And we wake up quite easily from that. Yeah, that that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah, it's so in, special. In fact, one time on on that trip with the with the Range Rover and the trailer, which was logistically and, and uh, practically uh, challenging, <laughs> shall sure. we say, uh, it was so windy one night I couldn't sleep on on the ground because I would finish up as part being part of a sand dune so i slept i perched my mattress strapped my mattress to the top of the trailer <laughs> you know i was chuckling all the time i said this this could not get any worse yeah and I, I slept on top of the trailer on on the mattress and then halfway through the night it pitter patter pitter patter <laughs> and i just i, I don't believe this <laughs> <laughs> too funny um but having said that, even I, I've slept out in in the UK in in you know temperate zones unquote uh, where you're liable to get rain anyway, and yeah. you you there's a you know a waterproof uh, uh, sleeping bag you can get into. Sure. And and it's fine. You know you just button it down and you say okay rain away get yeah. on that. Uh, the next thing that I was was hoping to talk about was the Vehicle Dependent Expedition Guide. You, you're you on what edition now? Six. Edition Sorry, six. Sorry, well, no, well, it's the sixth edition, yeah. sort of. I yeah. suppose, really, it's probably the seventh, but uh, it, it is called Edition 5A. Yeah. Because I made some very small editions uh, to take care of issues with the uh, Garmin, careful as I say this, yeah. Garmin <laughs> yeah. uh, nav equipment, sure. which we'd had given trouble. Yeah. And I wanted to straighten things out because it, it, the trouble looked worse than it was. Uh, sure. you, if you could, you could identify what what was giving trouble, and that was completely separate from the accuracy of the navigation, uh, which sure. is what was the important bit. Yeah, so sure. my message was, you know, it's fine. It's it's working off satellites up there, which are absolutely spot on. Yeah. 
but some of the onboard equipment inevitably is not so expensively engineered as a satellite mm. is and uh, you've got the bit that matters yeah so i wanted to incorporate that in, in the thing and also a glancing blow i'm in mean, at the very very early days yet but i i have to mention that the rivian electric mm -hmm. uh, uh pickup which at, at the time was uh and that was what about nine months ago now um at the time was the only sort of sensible they rivian seemed to have addressed the right things yes but it's still heavy mm. and my my uh, caveat was what about the tires yeah. you get this big heavy vehicle okay it's got the power weight ratio but has it got the tires the yeah. tires don't seem to have caught up no. now it may well be that mr rivian is saying yeah i couldn't agree more and i wouldn't mind some 900 by 16s on this rather than <laughs> 750s sure but nevertheless it's plus of course you can't get take jerry cans with an electric vehicle yeah there's limitations to it They're, uh, having driven the Rivian uh, for many months, it's oh, really? it's yeah. exceptional. It would it would give you a laugh for sure. Yeah, some fresh thinking there. Yeah. Really, I'd be very yeah. interested in it's, your view. Yeah, it's 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 a very special vehicle, um, and we took it we took a Rivian SUV to the most remote point that you can travel to on a road in North America, and it had just enough range to do that. And they they really are quite capable. To your point, though. The sand would be its nemesis because, yes, because uh, of the weight. They're, they're, they're almost 9,000 pounds and it's a 20 inch wheel. So yes. you can only air them down so With far. A, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. With a thin tire on it. That's yeah. the thing. They want bigger wheel arches and the wheel and tire industry needs to catch up with this, this yeah. issue if they're going to go, which they will have to. They're going to have to address, uh, you know, off-road vehicles uh, right. with electric. When you say you went to the extreme of range, w were you a nervous wreck when you were getting near home? You, you, you know, it, it's it, range anxiety. It's a thing. You you really because there's not an easy way to solve it. No. You know, with an internal combustion vehicle, you can even stick your thumb out and maybe the, a rancher comes by that has some extra fuel. Yeah. Or or you can take a. A, a, a jerry can and go into the town and come back with fuel yes um, with the electric vehicle it requires a very specialized solution That's which has right. to be yeah a, what sort of range were you uh on on that trip well we we did almost 200 miles of off-road driving so it's uh, 100 out and 100 back no it was it was 100 out and then we took a slightly different route yeah uh, to go out um the the one advantage that the electric vehicles have that's really interesting is its ability to regen so anytime you're going yeah. downhill you're actually getting energy back into yes. the battery which is quite interesting it's something that an internal combustion vehicle can't do of course the consumption sure. goes way down but you're still the engine's still yeah purring along and it's not putting power back into the vehicle but is that not just a question of putting back what you lost going up the hill pretty much yeah um, and of course, there's some some overall loss, um, just because it does take a lot more energy to go uphill than the regen can provide going Surely. down. Sure. Sure. Um, but it, it's a it's a new technology, and it's fascinating. I mean, it's not it going to be it's yeah. not going to be the solution to cross the Sahara yet. Maybe yeah. someday, but not yet. Everybody uh, writes about that we're waiting for the big battery breakthrough. Yeah. And, and I think that that's it, isn't it, really, to get the weight down. At some They're point getting very happen. much better than they were, aren't they? They really are. They really are. They keep getting more and more refined around that, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that the it's been fun to watch the <clears throat> vehicle-dependent expedition guide continue to get updated because the first volume was so significant and substantial that a lot of times those kinds of books never get kept up to date whereas between you and jonathan's help you've been able to keep um, for those that are listening jonathan hansen who's involved with the overland expo and and 7p international he helps absolutely yeah. with, with invaluable with help there yeah. and, and a, a solid perspective on yeah. some of the things that I, i'm saying yeah you know. he's very accomplished uh, i said hey jonathan what do you think and he says 
Yeah. He's very tactful there. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. He's he's a, he's he's a he's a true gentleman and a great and a great ambassador for what we love to do. Absolutely, yeah. So Jonathan is included in some of the newer newer volumes of the book. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I find um, is so interesting about the book is th- that you do go into a lot of detail around the supporting equipment. So clothing, uh, cooking sleeping, shipping, you, you go into all of these supportive logistical components of, of vehicle-based travel. So those that are listening, I, could, I would highly encourage that you go uh, to, it's desertwinds.com, yes. is that right? Yes, yes. Um, and take a look at the book. I think Jonathan and Roseanne might still have some copies available. Yeah, I, I was particularly pleased, actually. I, I got a bit carried away. Actually, I spent a time in the Air Force as a test pilot, and alongside the the arrangements at Farnborough was the uh, Aeromed Centre for the, for the RAF. And one, one got terribly analytical about everything mm. there and about clothing and uh, uh, clothing for pilots and so on and so forth. That caused me to rather go to town on the, the, on the clothing side of things mm-hmm. and I was very pleased I, I wondered if I'd ever done it actually I was very pleased though to hear from somebody in the clothing industry mm. who said hey look this uh, mm, yeah this is this is okay it was quite good so and I said ah oh, good well yeah. it helped it, it I think it helped me and I think many others it, you know inform a good baseline of decision making around equipment um, and the other thing that I really like about your your vehicle dependent expedition guide is it shows mostly stock vehicles accomplishing these significant yes. feats. So it reminds people that you don't really need to, nor should you heavily modify a vehicle for long expeditions. Has that been your experience? You want to avoid heavy modifications? The manufacturers uh, have a problem on their hands. Mm. Like the, the new Land Rovers, for mm. example. When I heard it was coming out, I almost ordered one blind. Mm. But when I saw it, I thought, oh my Lord, you know, it's about 20% bigger than I would want. Mm. And it isn't ideal for, well, it'll do an expedition, but it doesn't have a front diff lock. Mm. And you've got to be realistic and say, well, the guys who are you know, playing the bills for this thing sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, at the factory and putting in all the design work and the, uh, the production equipment and everything, they've got to get that money back. Yeah, that's so right. they've got to sell a lot of these things. So they've got to sell to a lot of people, not just the expedition people. Mm. So things like that um, have rather lowered its expedition capability, I think. But to answer your question about modifications, I think in general... Any kind of long range or even medium range expedition, uh, you're talking about taking out the back seats and using that for cargo, mm. uh, unless it's very short range. If you're not strapped for payload, if you're not really pushed for, for payload or, or up to your neck in, in jerry cans mm. of, of fuel and everything, you've probably got the payload to have a roof tent Mm. or something like that and in so-called uh, temperate zones uh, you could have a, a, a roof tent mm. and get into it and it, you're, you're a you're out of the insects snakes sure. and that kind of stuff and you're, you're protected from the rain mm. and, and that kind of thing. plus you can peep out you know say so <laughs> it's not very nice out there <laughs> Put it down again, you know? <laughs> so yeah it, it's kind of horses for course I think anything long range I would say yes you have to do modifications mm. um, Anything short range or medium range, you could probably add accessories, provided they're not too heavy. Mm. I have a thing about external add-ons, yeah. um, but you know, being realistic about it, and people with families yeah. uh, and that kind of thing, um, then yeah, a roof tent is, is very, provided again, the weather is yeah. not too windy. Yeah, no, things, conditions can change very quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Which yeah. is why, you know, a lot of times sleeping inside the vehicle is your best choice. That's if right. If you have room yeah, for it. Yeah. You have room for I it. I had a Suzuki Jimny. Yeah, those are fun. What a sweetie. Yeah. What a little sweetie. Yeah. I mean, it looks like um, son of G-Wagon. <laughs> it does. The look of it. It does. It's an awful shame. It came to the UK... And I thought I would have, I, again, I would have bought one. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, the petrol version didn't 
uh, accord with our sure. emission laws yeah, sure. and, um, and and that kind of thing. And also the, the gearbox, the automatic gearbox, wasn't just the top of the, top of the range there. <laughs> no, you know, it, it was nominally four. It was more like three, which yeah. in practice turned out like two. Yeah. <laughs> but if they'd, put a, if they'd put a, a, a really economical, low emissions engine in it, and, and a decent uh, a ZF yeah. gearbox, that would have been the catch for jump. The thing about it was, small as it was, you could sleep in it, no problem at all. Yeah. Certainly the passenger seat back would fold backwards, Fantastic. not forwards, sure. which I had to do in the, the Jeep, you ha it, the, the back goes forward, so sure. you're actually sleeping at, a, at an angle like uh. that. In the, in the Jimny, it goes towards the back of the vehicle, so you can sleep on it, and it's long enough to take a six footer, no problem at all. Fantastic. Fantastic. And you, you've got all this light around, you just crack the windows down <laughs> about that much to get for air share through. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so good. Absolute gem of a vehicle, that one. So for someone that is new to overland travel, what would be a couple pieces of advice that you would give them? Someone that was getting ready to start their own journey like you have. Ooh. Um, Words know of what, encouragement or... No, you know. Know what you don't know. Yeah. Don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. Don't be uh, afraid to be persistent in getting decent explanations mm. about things. And above all, have an eye for detail. Mm. If someone ac accuses you of being a, 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 a granny or a nitpicker, say, that's fine. <laughs> that's what it's about. Yeah, and it'll get you home. <laughs> because it, it's the detail that really counts. Mm. Thank you so much for taking the time with me today. It's been an absolute joy to hear about your adventures, to share your story with our audience. Um, I would highly encourage those that are listening, take a look and see if you can find a vehicle dependent expedition guide for yourself. Um, it is an incredible volume. It is, we have all called it the Bible of overlanding for a very long time. And it's a deserving attribute of... Oh, of, you're uh, very kind. And the, this companion book is 4 by 4 Driving, which... Yes, which is quite good. ...hasn't required, because it's these are tenets which are sort of hallowed yes. uh, over the year. Well, thank you for having me, and, and I hope I haven't bent your ears too much. No, I, I'm just so grateful that we could spend the time today. Scott, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs>